Hey everyone, today we are in Fort Worth, Texas at the Oakwood Cemetery, and we're here to discover a little bit more about Old West history. No matter where you look in this cemetery, it really is incredible. Every turn is different. Every place of the cemetery is scenic. But in the far back corner of the cemetery, there's an absolutely beautiful shot of downtown Fort Worth. And this is right by the grave that we're looking for. And this is the grave that we are looking for. This is J.B. Miller or James Brown Miller. And he was born October 25th, 1861. And he died by hanging in Ada, Oklahoma, April 19th, 1909. And then at the bottom it just says husband. And then right here it says Papa. You can see this is a family plot area, kind of dilapidated. This concrete is cracking and falling apart. I suppose it's this old oak tree that it's kind of sitting underneath that's pushing it apart. It's on a hill. The rain and the freezing weather and stuff like that has done some damage. James Miller is one of the men in the Old West that is sometimes an outlaw and sometimes a lawman. No matter which side he was on, he was always a killer. In fact, one of his nicknames was Jim the Killer Miller. He was also known as Jim the Deacon Miller because he always attended church, never cursed, smoked, or drank, and he was always sharply dressed. Jim was born on October 25, 1861 in Van Buren, Arkansas to Jacob and Cynthia Miller. When he was about a year old, the family moved to Texas. When he was eight years of age, he was accused of murdering his grandparents, although he was never prosecuted for that crime. On July 30th, 1884, he killed his brother-in-law, John Coop, with a shotgun blast while he was in bed sleeping at his home. Miller was sentenced to life in prison, but the conviction was overturned on a technicality. Miller was then hired on a ranch, and he married the daughter of the ranch owner, Sarah Francis, or Sally as she was better known, on February 15th, 1888. During this time, he started robbing stagecoaches and was reportedly an assassin for hire. He did get on the right side of the law, or so it would appear. By 1881, he moved to Pecos, Texas and was hired on as the deputy sheriff by Reeves County Sheriff Bud Frazier. Around this same time, cattle rustling and horse thieving increased in the area and Miller spent most of his time in pursuit of those thieves, but they always got away. This raised some suspicions in the mind of a local gunfighter named Barney Riggs who happened to be Bud Frazier's brother-in-law. When Frazier confronted Miller, he laughed off the accusation. Frazier then found out that Miller killed a Mexican prisoner who he claimed was trying to escape. But it's been said that this prisoner knew where Miller hid two stolen mules. Frazier fired Miller, but the church supported Miller and he was made the town marshal. This became the start of a feud between Frazier and Miller. Miller then hired some of his family and friends as fellow henchmen who worked with him on his side of the law. In 1893, Miller was accused of plotting to kill Frazier, but the state's only witness was killed. Most people thought this was done by Miller's henchmen, but regardless, the case was dropped. Miller did lose his job as town marshal, though, and he opened a hotel. On April 18, 1894, Frazier confronted Miller in the street. You're a cattle rustler and a murderer, he said. Frazier immediately began firing before Miller even had a chance. Frazier shot Miller in the arm and then in the groin. Miller tried to return fire, but his shot missed and it hit a local shopkeeper. Frazier then unloaded his revolver into Miller's chest. Miller's friends rushed him to a doctor, sure that he would die of his wounds. However, this was not the case and it was due to how he was dressed. Miller always wore a heavy frock coat no matter how hot it was outside and no one really understood why. This coat actually concealed a heavy iron plate that he put behind it and it covered his entire chest. The plate saved his life. Frazier couldn't believe that Miller survived the shooting and he had no idea about the steel plate. That December, Frazier attacked Miller again. He shot Miller in the arm and the leg and once again unloaded his revolver into the chest of Miller. But the metal plate saved Miller once again. Frazier was stunned beyond all belief and he ran away. Miller then pressed charges against Frazier for attempted murder and hired an attorney. Before Frazier could even go to trial, Miller's attorney was killed. Some suspected that it was at the hands of Frazier or one of his associates. Frazier went to trial, but it resulted in a hung jury and he was acquitted. 
Frazier then lost the re-election for county sheriff and left the area. The feud between the two seemed to have ended, but when Frazier returned to town in 1896, Miller killed him with a shotgun blast to the back of the head as he was playing cards in a saloon. Miller was then taken to trial for murder, but the jury refused to convict him because he argued that he had done no worse than Frazier had. A witness that testified against Miller in the trial was later murdered. It was reported that Miller killed the man and then rode a horse nearly 100 miles overnight in order to establish an alibi. Miller continued his life of murder as an associate for hire and always had the ability to escape the consequences. The murders were often committed with an accomplice. One would claim the responsibility for the shooting while the other would testify that it was in self-defense. Any witnesses and attorneys that would try to prosecute him would mysteriously die. Miller made a profitable business as a murderer for hire during the famous Texas Sheep and Cattle Wars. If anyone ever tried to reveal his crimes, then he just simply killed them too. In 1906, he was accused of killing a U.S. Marshal named Ben Collins, but again the witnesses mysteriously died and Miller escaped prosecution. Some people even suspected Miller of murdering the famous lawman Pat Garrett since one of his henchmen was with Garrett at the time. However, another man was convicted of that murder. In February of 1909, Miller was hired to kill a former U.S. Marshal and popular rancher named Gus Bobbitt over some land disputes. One night while riding home in his wagon, Miller ambushed Bobbitt with a blast from his shotgun. Bobbitt died from his wounds, but not before reaching his home and pointing the finger at Miller and telling his wife who did it. That testimony to his wife combined with some evidence was enough to arrest Miller, his accomplice, and the two men that hired him. They were all placed in the town jail in Ada, Oklahoma, and I'm sure that Miller was confident that he would be acquitted just like every other time. In April, a mob of local citizens, mostly neighbors of Gus Bobbitt, were disgusted at the justice system for letting such killers go free. About 50 or 60 stormed on the jail, subdued the deputies, and lynched all four men in a barn in Ada, Oklahoma. Miller's last words were reportedly, Let the record show I've killed 51 men. Let her rip. And then he jumped off the rafters and hanged himself. All four of the men were hanging in the barn for a couple hours until a photographer could be found to snap a photograph. His body was then shipped to Fort Worth, Texas for burial. After his death, a respected citizen said of Miller, He was just a killer, the worst man I ever knew. Miller is the kind of man where the law is blurred between outlaw and lawman. It is also very difficult to decipher between fact and fiction. No one is really certain how many people he actually killed or how bad he really was. But what we do know is that he was a murderer, and certainly not someone you could just judge from the appearance or the attendance at church he had. Now next to J.B. Miller is his wife, Sarah Frances Miller, October 12, 1871 to October 7th, 1938. And it just simply says wife, and her nickname was Sally. There's a couple other markers over here that are interesting. We'll go over and read them. They're actually facing the opposite direction as what these two are. They've got kind of these cement paths that could use a little bit of sweeping on them, but they're nice to have. So this is Leonard L. Jones, Texas chief mechanic in the 345th Field Artillery in World War I. July 26th, 1894 to July 27th, 1953. Did a quick search on Find a Grave and it said he was discharged honorably in 1919. It's just kind of interesting. I'm not sure what the connection is with the Millers. Maybe there's a family connection. I'm really not sure. It's just interesting that he is in this family plot area. And I don't know if there's anyone here in this sort of blank space or not. But this one right here is really interesting. I saw this and wondered who it was and did some quick research. This is Mary Ann Clements. And this is March 8, 1850 to June 21st, 1917. Wife of Manon Clements. And if you're not familiar with him, he also went by his original name, Emmanuel. But that was his nickname, Manon. And we'll give you a little bit of history of him as well. Now this sort of criminal realm is going to get really small all of a sudden. Sarah Miller's maiden name was Clements, and her father was Emmanuel or Manon Clements. 
Manon was the first cousin to John Wesley Hardin, and Hardin, if you know anything about him, received a law degree while he was in prison. Hardin became the attorney for Jim Miller at one point after the shootings with Sheriff Frazier. However, Hardin was killed before Sheriff Frazier ever went to trial. Emmanuel Clement Sr. was a rancher, outlaw, and gunfighter who headed up the violent and ruthless Clements family in McCulloch County, Texas. Manon grew up on a ranch, and he was very familiar with the cowboy ways. John Wesley Hardin and Manon were on a cattle drive to Kansas when Manon killed two brothers. Adolph and Joseph Shadden were disputing with Manon over his authority as the herd crossed over into Indian Territory. Manon was then jailed in Kansas by the famous lawman Bill Hickok. Manon was then released at the request of John Wesley Hardin, who was friends with Hickok. Later on, Manon helped Hardin escape from jail in 1872 by slipping him a file and pulling him through the bars with a lariat. When Hardin was sent to prison, Manon was one of the few people that visited him. Manon was always a cattle rustling suspect, and by the 1880s, he had quite a collection of cattle and horses. He hired Jim Miller to work on his ranch, and that is how Jim met Sarah Clements. Despite his past, Manon ran for sheriff in 1877 in Runnels County, but he lost the hotly contested campaign. On March 29, 1887, Manon was shot and killed in the Senate Saloon by Ballinger City Marshal Joseph Townsend. Soon afterward, Townsend was blasted by a shotgun while riding home one night. The suspect was never identified, but Manny believed it was Jim the Killer Miller. Townsend survived the blast, but he lost an arm in the incident. Sarah's brother, Emmanuel Clements Jr., was a Texas lawman and cattleman, but he was also involved in the Fraser-Miller feud. He was called Little Manny, or Manny, to distinguish himself from his father. When Deacon Jim Miller was hired as Pecos City Marshal, he hired Manny to work for him. Manny later drifted to El Paso in 1894 and wore a badge for 14 years as Deputy Constable, Constable, and Deputy Sheriff. During the 1890s, he reunited with Hardin and Miller. In 1908, Manny was indicted for armed robbery. He was acquitted, but it ruined his career as a lawman forever. Manny then turned to a life of drinking and was shot and killed in the Coney Island Saloon in El Paso on December 29, 1908. No one was ever charged with his murder. Rumor had it that he was killed because he had information on who killed Pat Garrett. So that's going to do it for today's cemetery tour and I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, check out some of the other Old West videos that I've done. As always, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you guys next time.